Um, third speaker, Jared Hickey, and co-founder of a local company, First Light Foods, and uh, it's a pretty neat company. Um, I've got a whole link through the value chain through venison, on venison and beef from farmers right through to the global customers. So um, about the value chain, Jared. Do you need help with the buttons like Tom? I'll, 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 I'll give it a go. I've had a couple of uh, people to learn from. Uh, kia ora katoa. Good to be here. Um, appreciate the chance to talk to you uh, about uh, what we're doing locally. Um, I understand, you know, listening to the last couple of speakers, our aim is to challenge you a little bit, and I suppose uh, what uh, I've been given to do is to talk to you about a couple of areas. I suppose one is value versus commodity, and the other one is value chain, uh, which is obviously design thinking um, as opposed to, again, to, to commodity. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I'm lucky that I'm talking to you ahead of the vegan speaker, Melissa. Um, so I'm representing the 97% of the people in the room who are eating a wonderful product, and uh, we're all about producing the best possible product. Melissa will talk to you later. <laughs> okay, first slide. So a little bit about the business before we get into the value chain itself. So first of all, we're Hawke's Bay based, uh, based over in Hastings. Um, so we say we're an integrated value chain business. So we're integrated, as you'll see me talk, from essentially genetics through to the consumer. Um, our vision is to be at the very top end. So we want to be producing the world's premium grass-fed beef. We want to sell it to customers who care enough to afford our product. And so again, we're talking about people who buy with their heads and their hearts, not their stomachs. Um, and we want that beef produced by farmers who care, who care enough, to, again, to, to stop the commodity wave and produce a product that is all about value, all about the way it's produced, knowing that the consumers who care will pay for it. Uh, the why, so we've been in operation since 2002. Uh, the why we exist, essentially, is we are a small player in the, the red meat sector, but we are keen to shake some trees. Uh, we're keen to actually leave New Zealand and the world better, so that's the why we're here. Uh, it's just some a pictorial about the business. So uh, three founders still remaining in the business today. Uh, 374 farmers involved in the Wagyu side of the business, so that's dairy farmers, uh, calf rearers, backgrounders, finishers, uh, Angus breeders, producers. We've also got a, a venison side to our business, uh, 200 farmers pretty much on the knocker there. And then within Hawke's Bay, we've got new product development people, livestock team, processing teams. We process at Ensco and Greenlee and venison packers and fielding. An accounting team, because they tell me you need accountants. <coughs> Uh, a marketing team, which largely today is social, will, uh, social media, and they're half my age. Um, and the sales team, which increasingly is offshore. So the value chain, again, which is why I was asked to come and talk to you. So it's very important, it's been very important for us to understand fully our, our value chain. So that does start with genetics uh, and the Wagyu side of the business. It starts with genetics produced here in, in Pokao and Hawke's Bay. We obviously have a, uh, a value chain which then has a, a breeder, would that be an Angus producer uh, or a dairy farmer. A calf is really reared on its mother, a red in the calf shed. Those cattle then go to a backgrounder, potentially from three months, six months of age, through to 18 months of age, and then a finisher the last year of life. We then uh, process those cattle in North Island at Greenlee, South Island at Ansco, and what we then do is we've got our own importing distribution businesses offshore, so whether that be in the US, UK, Europe, UAE, or here in New Zealand. And so we pay someone to distribute, which essentially is a fee to, to, to uh, drop the product off to the retailer. And then obviously we've got 550 retailers where our product is in, and ultimately the consumer. So that's the value chain. And I suppose the, the key, looking back 17 years in business now, is we could have got there a lot quicker had we understood these four things. So this is the key to our value chain success, and we'd suggest that in design thinking as opposed to commodity thinking, this is a way for New Zealand for the future. So they sound quite straightforward, but again, it's taken us 17 years to get there. So the first one is truly, truly, truly understand your consumer. So that means 
getting into their house, sitting around their table, looking in their fridge, understanding their consumer habits. It sounds easy, but it needs to be done. Second of all, have a product that no one else has got. So differentiate your product. So 30 years ago, when I was starting out, bull beef was in. I mean, bull beef's still a wonderful product, but it's not differentiated. So differentiate your product. The third one is just as you've understood your consumer, understand your producer, understand the way that your farmer thinks and wants to think and wants to head. And lastly, control and build it all with a consumer brand. So just go through those points one at a time. So understanding your consumer. So welcome to First Light, Jane. So we stole this idea from Icebreaker. But in essence, we believe that Jane is our model consumer. Uh, so this is where she is. She's based in, on the west coast of the USA. Uh, and those points that are written there really explain what it is, that she, how she thinks and, and how she acts. But in essence, remember I talked before about someone who, who, uh, who earns enough and is wealthy enough to care about what she's buying. So what do we know about her? So this is our typical US consumer. She's between 35 and 55 years of age. Uh, her household income is reasonably significant, 150 grand or higher, so that's the household income. Um, and she is married with a couple of kids. So the priorities, first of all, she may not be buying this product for herself. She might be in Melissa's camp, but she's certainly buying it for her, uh, her husband and her children, and probably a dog, actually, as well. <laughs> so what's the priority? What are the priorities that she's making that consumer decision based on? So first of all, it's got to be great to eat. If it's not great to eat, then we're wasting our time. Second of all, closely following is it good? Is, is it good for me and my family? So that's, that's health. That's nutrition. Is it really going to be good for us? Then she goes down to, OK, how was this animal grown? Was it, was it grown in an animal welfare friendly way? Um, then, mm, who is this company producing this product? Are these people real? Is it a corporate with a big feedlot? Or are these real people, real farmers, real family people? And lastly, um, what damage am I doing to the world by buying this product, consuming this product? So it's by understanding Jane fully that we can make our best decisions. So there's a picture of Jane on the wall of our office. And there's not a meeting that goes by on a daily basis where we don't say, what would Jane think? What would Jane do? So again, um, we stole this from Icebreaker. But we really encourage anyone in this business to, to understand your consumer fully. Again, this was, this was developed through focus groups, um, through following people home in a strange sort of way, <laughs> uh, sitting around the table, looking at their fridges, and understanding how they eat and, and how they, they earn, how they buy. What we've learned from Jane is that 17 years into the business, we don't know where the price ceiling is that Jane's willing to pay. So if you could hit all those points, we'd suggest uh, the world is our oyster in terms of pricing, price points. So that's the first point of value chain success, is it know your customer, your consumer. The second one is to have a differentiated product. And so no surprises that well, our product looks differently, looks different to most New Zealand beef, and it's because it's a grass-fed Wagyu beef product, and it's sold according to its marbling score, which is written down at the bottom there. So uh, a two to three is a low level of marbling, a seven or a nine is a high level of marbling, and essentially from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, a value is created. That isn't to say that, that Jane herself wouldn't mind eating a two to three, and her kids a four to five, and a husband a six or better, but ultimately we're finding that differentiated product is the key. So again, how have we differentiated our product? So first of all, it is the only marbled Wagyu beef in the world. So there is no one else producing this product. Any other Wagyu beef you see globally is produced probably with one to two years on grain. Um, second point is obviously the Wagyu genetics out of Japan, um, something unique, not a lot in the world. And thirdly, while we're also working with the Angus, the Kiwi Cross Dam has been determined as a product that is producing um, even more marbling than the rest. So a Kiwi Cross Dam being 
a dam that not many other people are looking to use. Uh, second, uh, next, we need to be antibiotic free. So the product needs to be produced in a way that uh, antibiotics aren't given to the animal, and if it is, it just needs to go to a different value chain. Uh, GMO free is very important to Jane and these consumers, so our products produced in that way, and lastly, certified humane, which is a, a US authority on animal welfare. So all of those points there are relatively unique, the differentiated. What it means is that when we go and see our customers of the world, uh, we've got a product that no one else is going, we've got confidence that no one else is going to come in the door right behind us and offer the same deal. So a differentiated product. Understand our producer. So just as we, we understand about Jane, we've done the same research to understand about John. His name's Andy, but John we'll call him. So, Again, what's unique about our producer? And again, those points are covered there. They are generally farmers that are looking to understand about their product beyond the farm gate. So their interest is into the marketplace already. They're also looking for price certainty um, as opposed to a trading margin. And they're quite happy to share what they're learning with other farmers as opposed to perhaps more independent thinking. So again, our typical producer New Zealand producer, again 35 plus years of age, 17 years ago they were certainly 35, um, and their priorities again, and I suggest in this order, long term price certainty. So we want to be part of something where we know the price we're going to get, the time we take that calf, we know two years later what price we'll get. The second one is market linkage, What's it, where is it going in the market, how can I be sure it's sustainable and that level of business will continue. Um, third, this mantra that I produce the best and I want to be paid for it. So I'm sick of the averaging machine. I want to be paid for producing what I can afford to do. Fourth one is transparency. Naturally inquisitive. I want to know where our product's going. I want to know what, what margin everyone's making here and whether this supply chain and value chain is sustainable. Uh, and the fifth one is, is this model we call a producer group model where the farmers within the group share everything they've learned to actually make the producer group as a whole uh, work better. So those are the farmers we're looking for. I still believe that's probably 5 or 10% of New Zealand farmers. Um, I can pretty much sit around the, around the kitchen table with a farmer now, um, and I reckon in five minutes we can determine whether we're made for each other or not. The last point, which really sews all this up, and has probably been the latter point in our development of value chain, is about brand. And we all know branding is important. We understand about Coca-Cola and Nestle's of the world, but ultimately uh, we believe and we know that to have ultimate control of our product we have to sell it under our brand. And it's only through selling our own product and our own brand can we tell our story to the consumer and command a sustainable price point. So as soon as we become raw material or ingredient suppliers, we are dumbed down to the lowest common denominator. So we're committed as a business to have all our products sold under our brand, whether it be a, a premium steak um, or a hot dog or a, or a meatball. Uh, we're in 550 stores today with this product range. We'll be in 1,000 by the end of next year. So we believe we need to go to markets of the world where we can control brand. So the likes of UK retail example, we're not strong in there because they're just too tough to get our brand in. So we need to be in markets where we can control our brand. So there's many a times where I've been uh, keen to to sell product to a customer under their brand and I know it's the wrong thing to do. We have to control our brand and as New Zealanders we have to be more devout about ingredient supply to finished goods. So again, I think I've just covered those points there. Probably the other point there is that we, it has to be a nose to tail business. So again, we can't just be in the steak business, we've got to be in the hot dogs and the, and the sausage business because that is the way to make and increasingly, um, adding, increasingly um, adding value to all parts, such as a cooked brisket is the most recent product we're working on. So wrapping all those together, again, would suggest that the way out of the commodity cycle um, is to think differently. Uh, it is to look at a value chain model as opposed to a commodity model. And these are the four steps that we'd suggest that we've used uh, to achieve that. How much time have I got, Graham? You have one minute. Okay, progress to date. Very quickly, in February 2019, this year, Forbes magazine came and did a global search for the world's best beef, and we were it. Um, so that's a great claim. That left, led to a 30% increase in US sales overnight. 
Uh, we also won gold medals in the World Steak Awards in 18 and 19. So the key point is marbled grass-fed beef eats superbly well. Another one is a, um, a US, very wealthy US gentleman who wants to own and open a chain of restaurants and burger joints came to us last year, or 18 months ago, um, and is modelling his entire business on only using 100% grass-fed Wagyu beef. So that chart up there, the black chart, is a wall of six metres by four metres, and it's now in every one of his restaurants exclusively using our product. So he's bought a small share in our business, we've bought a small share in his business to basically wrap up that supply chain. He believes this is the best beef. He is rolling out a series of, um, of restaurants for it. And the last one is that we've developed our own e-commerce channel or steak club, again with um, the student's help. Uh, what we've learnt there is that there are a high number of high net worth individuals and affluent professionals globally. Um, so we've launched this, this, this uh, launched in last October. So that product will be delivered to a consumer's door. Uh, they'll pay 2,000 US dollars a year and we'll give them something uh, for four people to eat. It'll be our best beef. We won't tell them what it is. We'll give them a video of how to produce it, but it'll be delivered to their door every day. They're paying a roughly 150 US dollars a kilogram for this product, but they're getting our best beef. We're at, we've gone from 100, 140 members. We believe we'll be at 2,000 within a couple of years. So again, just the whole affluent consumer. Last one. Uh, is uh, essentially just showing that the growth in supply that's taking place. So essentially we're, we're a business that's growing. We won't be huge, but we certainly are growing. We're national from Northland to Southland, and that's the animal itself. Thank you.